Good morning, everybody. Hope you had a fantastic weekend. This is our Monday morning call. As usual, this is a great time to, uh, if you've got questions, got concerns, things are going well, things are going poorly, please type them in. Or if you're on a headset, I love that if somebody would talk to me on these calls. So um, type those in or, or raise your hand and we'll open up your line if you can talk to us. Uh, again, any problem you're having, probably somebody else is having, or any victory you're having, everybody would love to hear. So we can all share and learn from each other's experiences. With that said, um, obviously I always have stuff to cover, so we'll go ahead and uh, get started on that until we see if anybody else has some things to, to talk about. So, first thing I want to talk about is a major, <laughs> a major uh, uh, development in the, the the industry, which is the Hartford Variable Annuity has 60,000 clients, and they're telling them all that they have to reallocate their account va ooh, values. How about values? Uh, their account values toward more cons. Boy, I didn't go back and do a spell check, did I? I just added this not five minutes ago and didn't do a spell check, so I apologize for that, guys. Clients will need to reallocate their accounts toward a more conservative investments by October 4th. Those failing to make those changes will lose their income rider they've been paying for for years. So broker-dealers are worried. Why are broker-dealers, first of all, why is the variable annuity company doing this, guys? And Hartford's one of the bigger VAs. Why are they doing this? Oh, I've got to move out. I'm getting some answers here. I can't see what they're saying, so let me move this out. Losing money. I said, right, Michael. So, why um, oh, Why would they be losing money, guys? Oh, Ed, Ed Storrs, he had two clients come in the last week about this. Yeah, I mean, why are, uh, why are broker dealers worried about this? Why do you think broker dealers are worried about this? Because, you know what, the lawsuits, that's right, they're worried about getting sued because if they don't go and talk to every single one of these clients by October 4th and they lose that income rider they've been paying for for years, there's going to be lawsuits, there's going to be complaints, there's going to be everything. So they've created, Hartford has created all sorts of work for the new, uh, for uh, advisors with, by doing this. So the reason that Hartford's doing this is that they're making people go more conservative because they can see that Variable annuities with income benefit providers are not actuarially sound. How long have I been talking about this? I've been talking about this since 2006, and it came to fruition in the last couple of years, and it seems to be accelerating. I mean, this is this is pretty harsh for some for Hartford guys. When they first signed up for that variable annuity with income benefit rider, were there any of these uh, um, uh, limitations on the variable annuity? So they're changing the game midstream. You know what makes clients really really angry when you change the game after they already have their money with you? I would not want to be an advisor who sold a Hartford Variable Annuity right now. That would be a really uncomfortable, really uncomfortable conversation to have. So uh, th do you think the Hartfords, I mean, we've already seen what they've been doing. They're, they're no longer offering it. They're trying to buy back these income benefit riders, and now they're just, this is like, uh, well, they're not, they're not uh, selling them back to us, so we're just going to uh, uh, create martial law here and make our own rules. Do you think this is going to slow down or, get, or speed up for Variable Annuities? Think there are going to be less than variable annuities doing this, or more variable annuities doing this? I wouldn't touch a variable annuity right now with an income benefit rider with a 10-foot pole. So this is uh, we've seen the the pullback from these variable annuity companies accelerate. They first of all they said they're not going to sell anymore. Then they're saying we're going to buy it back, and now we got martial law being created. And we're changing the rules midstream for our clients. And who has to talk to the clients? Is the Hartford going out and visiting all these clients, or do you have to go back and visit your own clients? But as Ed said, gosh darn, this is a fantastic selling opportunity. Why? To get people out of the Hartford variable annuities and into the wealth max. Uh, I, uh, Michael said we got a question on the wealth max here. They're saying um, can't find anything about tax issues in the wealth max presentation. Guys, right underneath the uh, wealth max presentation on the site, there's a video that shows how to deal with taxes. There's a and it shows basically the worst tax scenario you could deal with. So if if the worst, if you can deal with the worst tax scenario with the wealth max, guess what? Anything else is going to be easy. So there's a little video underneath. There's three videos to show the wealth max presentation. One is the presentation itself. One is how to deal with the taxes, and one is how to actually uh, take the application. So it's right in there uh, under the uh, sales presentation. So Ed says we need a letter to send to everyone on the. Yeah, absolutely. If you send a letter to, to your <laughs> to your clients or your prospects talking about the Hartford annuities. You could have all sorts of uh, people coming in to see you. So, guys, this is a huge, huge opportunity. Please take advantage of it. And then uh, the, the next thing I want to talk about, let's see, we need to, so, 
I'm going to go into the next part of the presentation here. Because the, so any more questions on the on this Hartford annuity uh, variable annuity situation and how to take advantage of it? Okay. So the next thing I want to cover kind of ties into this. Advisor One, which is the advisor um, uh, uh, magazine's website. But actually, actually, I, I actually got this out of their their magazine. They had an article in there by Bill Miller called "The Fear Factor." And if you're not familiar with the Fear Factor, it's a TV show where they try to scare the bejesus out of people. Well, um, Bill Miller was talking about the Fear Factor with advisors, and he was talking about a recent survey. And the survey was asking advisors, "Hey, what's your number one issue? What's your number one fear? What's your number one fear?" And they, people were coming up with all sorts of things like public confidence, tax law changes, political irresponsibility, FINRA. So it was all these things, you know, the the, the white bread things that we all say we're afraid of. And Bill Miller was poking fun at this. Because really, are, are advisors really afraid of public confidence? I mean, that's what you wake up at night on. Or tax law changes, you wake up at night sweating because of tax law changes. Political irresponsibility, you toss and turn, you can't even go to sleep because of political responsibility. FINRA, really? Not unless you're in trouble, you're really not all that worried about it. You don't worry about FINRA until they what? Knock on your door. So he's saying, this is not what we need to be afraid of. There's other things we need to be afraid of. And I thought it was hilarious uh, when he walked through this. And he does a much better job than me because I'm giving you the outline. But he actually walks through how the show would look. So his fear factor for advisors looks like this. You have two players. One is John from New York City, and nothing comes out of him stinks. Two, Bob works for a folksy little firm, a firm in Illinois. So they're going to play fear factor. So let's play. For Bob, Bob's our first contestant up. And the announcer says, Bob, I'd like you to please explain on live TV and to all of your clients in the audience, why it's in their best interest to pay you 3 or 4% every year on your variable annuities. And what percentage of that is the, uh, of the average 7% rate of return for the market over the last 100 years? So, there are, so please tell people why they, <laughs> your clients should be paying half of what they make on average to you. Now, how many of you would like to, that are selling, selling variable annuities, would like to get in front of live TV and tell people why you're charging them 3 to 4% every single year in the variable annuity. Hey, hey, it's great when you can pretend like that fee doesn't exist and hide it, right? Again, sins by omission. You don't lie to the client. You just, these advisors don't lie to the client that's selling variable annuities. They just conveniently forget to tell them about it. And they have all sorts, when I talk to advisors, they have all sorts of reasons why they don't do that. Do that. Well, you know, I don't want to confuse the client. Well, you know, the client's getting a good deal. Right, 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 right. Well, you know, the client's got death benefits. Right, right, right. They got all sorts of reasons. Well, if you're proud of the fact that you charge them 3 or 4%, guess what you should do? Tell them. How many, uh, Jeff uh, Freebert, <laughs> we, we've been doing this for 13 years now. How many of, the, uh, of our advisors that have used the disclosure meeting and have gone over the variable annuity with their clients, the client said, oh, yeah, yeah, I know about that 3 or 4%. Yeah, no one knows about it. <laughs> not one in 13 years out of the tens of thousands of meetings that our guys have had collectively not one no, I've never heard anyone say that they knew about it no yeah not one and guys the stock market has averaged 7% over the last hundred years so that three or four percent is on average half of the clients rate of return is going to fees so how would you like to explain that that's something that you should wake up in a cold sweat I mean if this ended up if, if there was a uh, a uh, <laughs> a newspaper headline in the Wall Street Journal or in the New York Times or in your, more importantly in the paper in your town that said hey all variable annuities have you paying three to four percent that's half of all your return going back to your advisor now would that something would that be something that would give you the fear factor and if so what are you doing about it well one of the things we do about it is we actually take advantage of that we leverage that that's why we're able to move so many variable annuities Guys, I moved millions and millions and millions, tens of millions of dollars personally, and we've moved a, over a billion dollars in variable annuities as collectively because of this. Not because variable annuities are bad, but because the advisor didn't tell the client about these fees. So let's continue to play. Guys, first of all, how, if, you sell variable, if somebody sells variable annuities, how comfortable are they going to have a little fear factor if this ends up on if this ends up on the front page of their local paper. Do you think they're going to be they sweat a little bit? Darn right they are. So I have a question here on the wealth max. When is the appropriate time to go over the medical questions? Guys, 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 guys. 
we have three presentations. So go to the website, the 5Q website, the member site, and on the presentations, so you have the, the agreement meeting, the disclosure meeting, and then the implementation meeting. Under implementation meeting, well, why am I even talking about this? Here, I should just show you. So just a second here, I'll bring it up, guys, so we can all be on the same page. And I'll have it up here in a second, guys. So people are asking about, you know, how to do this wealth max with taxes, how do you do when you, with the medical questions, all that stuff. Let me just show you. So I pause, uh, apologize for the, uh, hey, Jeff, can you talk while I'm doing this? Yeah. Uh, you know, the thing is, with variable annuities, it's not that they're bad, it's just that the fees, you know, there's, a, there's an old saying that if, uh, uh, people used to say years ago, you know, is it okay if you're, you know, if you're married and you look at a girl, or if you're married and, and all you do is kiss a girl? or you're not married but you're dating seriously, what's okay, what's not okay? And the general rule of thumb is this. If you would be embarrassed if somebody found out, then you probably shouldn't do it to begin with. If you'd be embarrassed that this came out and this hadn't been explained, then guess what you probably shouldn't do to begin with? Sell it. I think you're good. Yeah, that's exactly. And guy, and, and have we had some guys um, that sell, sold variable annuities move their competitors' variable annuities into their variable annuities. Yeah, we did. Because it's not that variable annuities are inherently bad. It's that you didn't tell them about it. There is no perfect investment out there, guys. I am not saying variable annuities are bad. Now, I'm saying that I wouldn't be selling a variable annuity with a 10-foot pole or touch a variable annuity with a 10-foot pole now if it has an income benefit rider. Not because it's bad, but because it's so good. So what do I mean by that? Why, why, why am I, what do I mean by when I say, I wouldn't touch a variable annuity with an income benefit rider with a 10-foot pole because it's so good? Why would I say that? What do I mean by that? Why would I say that? Guys, because it's so good, it's so much in the client's favor that what are companies like the Hartford doing? Are, are these companies really in the business of, of making deals unbelievably good for the client and unbelievably bad for themselves? No. So all of these things that are out there right now, these variable news that income benefit writers, they're going to be rescinded in one shape, for, form, or manner. We've seen all sorts of ways they're doing that. And now, like I said, they're, they're creating martial law with it. So let me get back here. So, so the question was, we had earlier, where do you find out about how to deal with the taxes? And then we got a second question, how do you, where do you talk about the medical questions? So the agreement meeting is the first meeting. Uh, Jeff, are we seeing this? Yep, we're okay. seeing it. Okay, the first meeting is agreement meeting. Second, preparing for the disclosure meeting. Disclosure meeting, implementation meeting. So I hit implementation meeting. Okay, so I go to selling presentation. So in the selling presentation, I have the, the actual presentation, taking the application, which will uh, Bill talk about, uh, the medical questions and dealing with the taxes. So this is the actual presentation. Then, if it's outside of a uh, uh, qualified account, you don't need to. You can just do this and take the application. If it's inside a uh, qualified account, you're going to do the presentation, then deal with the taxes, and then take the application. So the dealing with the taxes right here tells you exactly how to do it. And we do it with worst case scenario, guys. If it works with the worst case scenario, obviously it's going to work with a better case scenario. And then taking the application is where we show you how to deal with the medical questions and actually let them know that it's life insurance and taking the actual application. So any more questions on that? So those are good questions, guys. Any other questions on the, the wealth max before we go forward? Okay, I'm going to just move this off here. Okay, we're back. So this is the fear factor, the 3 or 4%. But that, remember, that's only Bob. So Bob takes off running. But then there's only one contestant left. So let's see what this other contestant is going to do, uh, uh, have to face. The next player is John from New York, who's you know what doesn't stink. So John, this is a two-part question that we've hooked uh, that we've hooked you up to a lie detector for, and every time you answer untruly, you will get a shock. So we've flown in two of your biggest clients for the for these questions. Whoops! Ah, first question: Is it really a ten times more expensive to manage my million-dollar account than a hundred-thousand-dollar account? So guys, I want you to think about that. Is it really fair? If, would you really want on your local paper as a headline, if you're a money manager, 
<laughs> that that you charge the same fee for a, a million dollar account, a five hundred thousand dollar account, and a hundred thousand dollar account. Is that really fair? No. Because let me ask you a question. When I go to the car dealership, do I pay the same for a uh, uh, Lincoln as I do for a Ford Fusion? No. I'm going to pay more for the Lincoln. Why? I'm getting more for it. But really, what value do you, are you providing to your client who has 500000 that has versus the one that has 600000 why should that one pay, that has 600000 pay 20% more than the 500000 How can you validate that you're <laughs> providing 20% more value to that client? Hey, it's not a problem, right, no, as long as nobody thinks about it. It's not a problem as long as nobody questions it. But how would you like that on the, net, on the front page of your local paper? How would you like your clients to be in front, you to be in front of national TV as your clients are asking that? I'm a little confused. Because you're charging me six thousand dollars and you're charging him five thousand dollars, what are you doing to ch for me? That's a thousand dollars better a year than for this guy. How would you like to be answering that question in front of the national uh, audience? And question number two: Is it really right to charge a management fee on top of a third-party management fee every year? Now I could understand why I would pay you the first year. Because you're out there looking for the best money manager. You're out there trying to find me the best money manager. I'll pay you. It's like a finder's fee. It's like, you know, if, I, if I'm a scout or a talent scout and I find the, this actor or this ball player, do I get a, a, a percentage of that, that ball player's uh, uh, earnings or the, that actor's earnings for the rest of his life, or do I get a 10% finder's fee? So, again, as long as nobody talks about it, it's fine. But when people start talking about it, how badly is that going to reflect upon you? Because if you think about it logically, does, guys, let me ask, does it make any sense? It does make sense that you get paid initially to go out, scout, find the money manager. But after that, why should you get paid anything? Because who's doing all the work? The money manager. So why am I bringing this up, guys? How can you use this information? Can you use these questions, these fear factors? If this is something money managers first, and believe me, money managers would be afraid to death for these questions to be asked. So guess where we can ask these questions, guys? If you have a money management account, if you have a money management account, oh, that's, that's funny, Michael. My clients are liberals. They like to subsidize my poorer clients. <laughs> I like that, Michael. So, so uh, um, the fact is, guys, could you use these questions uh, in the disclosure meeting? for uh, people that have managed money. So could we do that, Jeff? Yeah, absolutely. What, what do you think, Jeff? And again, cause, just because nobody else, if somebody wants to get out in here and talk to me, that would be terrific. But Jeff, what do you think a client's going to think if I say, geez, you know, I'm confused on why do you think this guy is charging his people with, charging you, because you have $500,000 with them, or $5,000, uh, $5, uh, $5, and, and giving everybody, people who only have $400,000 a bigger discount? Yeah, they're going to wonder why. Yeah, why? Why would somebody that's giving them less money, why would he give people that are, he has less money, that have less money with them, a discount? Does that make any sense? No, not at all. Hmm. So really, it seems to me, he's seeing what he can want. You've ever seen those, those shows, the, the news shows, Jeff, where they show a, a, an airplane? And on the airplane, yeah. they have all the seats marked, and they say, hey, this guy paid 100 bucks, this guy sure. paid 800 yeah. bucks. What's the point of that, uh, that show? Well, why should everybody pay different for diff for the same seat or for this ride on the airplane? Why is everybody and, paying a different price? And the only reason they can is because the person paying eight hundred bucks what? Well, you just didn't know any better. So, do we really want? What do we feel about an airplane uh, or uh, airlines that does that to us? And we're not happy about it. Hmm. What do we feel about a money manager or uh, an advisor does that to us? Yeah, we I'm, we're not happy about it. If I'm giving him more money, should I be getting paying more or should I be paying less? I think he should pay less. I would think. And then we go to the next question. Yeah, you know, everybody needs to be paid, don't they, Jeff? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you don't want somebody working for free. If he was working for free, what kind of job would he do? Not a good one. Yeah. 
But you know, if you, would you pay a guy a thousand, two thousand dollars to go and shop and find you the best money manager? I mean, that would be a, a worthwhile investment, wouldn't it? Sure. But now, after he's finding you the best manager, now how long have you been with this manager, Jeff? Yeah, the last seven, eight years. Yeah. Once he's found that manager, though, who's doing all the work? Your advisor or the actual money manager? Well, the money manager is. So I, I think we need to pay the money manager, right? Because what's he doing every day? Well, he's watching the account and picking the stuff that we're going to be in, and he's doing all the work. Yeah. If we watched the news shows and we saw that the government had a jail, right, and they had guards watching the jail, and then, then we were paying guards to watch the guards watch the jail, and that was costing us twice as much money, would there be a, a, an outcry? Yeah. Why? Because you don't need guards to watch guards. No, you don't, do you? No. So now what, what do you have right now? Your, your advisor found you a great money manager, right? Right. And you should pay that, pay up for that, right? Yeah. But now you're paying for it for whatever year. Is he going out and finding a, a new brand new money manager every year? Or who's doing all no, the work? We're, well, the money manager is doing all the work. So now we've got the guards, you know, we're paying the guards to watch the guards watch the prisoners, or we're paying the advisor to watch the money manager to watch the money. If we really distrust that money manager, what should we do? Get rid of the money manager. Shouldn't we? Yeah. So I'm confused. Why? Uh, maybe there's something I'm missing here. Why, why are you being double billed? Yeah, I guess I'm not sure. Why do you think you're being double billed? Because uh, he wants to make more money. So guys, am I saying, Jeff, am I saying money managers are bad and the way that people charge no. are bad? No. What am I saying? You're saying that uh, you need to disclose that if that's what you're doing. And how many, Jeff, do you, th uh, do you think uh, advisors are going through number one and number two with their clients? The fact that None they're charging really uh, monetarily I, charging more, charging somebody monetarily more to have more money with them <laughs> than people who have less money with them. Yeah, I, yeah, that's not being covered. And how many people would think that's fair? Guys, ask yourself. You can you can uh, validate all you want, but the guy on the street, when we bring these two things up to them, what are they going to say? That it's fair or unfair? They're going to say it's unfair. So think about these things, okay? So that's the real fear factor, not all these other, really? This is the stuff we're worried about, public confidence, tax law change, political responsibility, FINRA. No, these are the things that we should be worried about. The fees that we're charging people, how we're charging it to them, and if we're charging it to them every year, what value are we providing? You know, guys, it's not too hard to get a client to jump on board the bandwagon that they're being screwed when you talk about these things. So that's the real fear factor. The, thing, the actual thing I want to talk about today was this, the checklist. The Checklist Manifesto was an excellent book written by Atul Gawande. And what he, uh, what he found is that uh, in his research, um, when his research team introduced one in eight hospitals in 2008, major surgery complications dropped. So what he did is he developed checklists. He found that doctors were not using checklists. Because the doctor, why didn't doctors need to use checklists? They're, they're uh, smart. They're the most accomplished people in their, uh, in their uh, field. They're, they, they've been told they're smart. They've got this, all these people supporting them. Why do they need checklists? Yet when Dr. Gwande actually introduced checklists, when his team introduced checklists, uh, one in eight hospitals in 2008, major surgery complications dropped by 36% and deaths plunged by 47%. Guys, if you're going into a hospital, what's the first question you're going to ask them? I know the first question I'm going to ask them. If the hospitals that used, um, if the hospitals that used checklists, their complications dropped by 36% and deaths plunged by 47%, what are you going to ask that hospital? Yeah, exactly, Eric. Do you use checklists? It, guys, 36% less complication, 47% less deaths. Is that a small thing? And you're thinking, well, what kind of checklists are they using? Oops, went the wrong direction. Well, here's one example. At John Hopkins, they just used this, this, this crazily complicated checklist. Wash hands with soap, clean patient's uh, site with antiseptic, drape patient with sterile sheets, wear a sterile mask, gown, and gloves, dress insertion site with sterile bandage. So, anybody want to guess uh, how, how many uh, doctors are doing this? Guys, is this complicated? Would we know to do this? 
We as lay people, would we know to wash our hands, clean the patient with antiseptic, drape the patient with sterile sheets, wear a sterile mask, gown, and gloves, and dress the insertion site with a, a sterile bandage? Would we as lay people know to do that? Johns Hopkins, good hospital, bad hospital. One of the, one of the a world renowned hospital. Do you want to guess how many people, how many doctors were following this, uh, missed a step? Do you want to guess how many doctors missed a step? These are not complicated steps. Five easy steps. More than a third skipped a step. I mean, that's scary as hell, isn't it? And doctors and surgeons refuse. I have a very simple uh, fight plan. You're right, Dale. And, and doctors refuse to do this. Why? They think they're above a checklist. They think checklists are for who? Warehouse workers. They don't think they should have checklists. Guys, if a third of them are missing these basic steps, who should be using a checklist? Every single friggin' doctor should be using a checklist. In fact, and then when they started to use checklists, here's what they found. Uh, I had a patient just the week, the week before Christmas who had a tumor found in his abdomen. It was on multiple spinal x-rays he'd had, but they were just looking for the, sp the spine, and they forgot to check other images. It's a case of basic mistake radiologists can make. But if you have a checklist, you sure you look. So this guy had multiple spinal x-rays, and they missed a tumor, because they weren't looking for a tumor. They were only looking for an x-ray. Crazy. I mean, how much that can kill somebody, right? The Mayo Clinic here in my hometown adopted the checklist that we designed. And they actually reduce their operating. So it does, a lot of doctors said, well, I don't want a checklist because it wastes time. It takes too much time. Well, the Mayo Clinic found that it actually reduced operating time because it helped the teams be more prepared. There wasn't like, oh, I forgot to do that. Oh, da -da -da -da. oh for the no. So boom, 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 boom. Guys, when you have a checklist, can you do things faster or slower? Way faster. So why are people not using checklists? So why aren't they? Well, first of all, why do you need to? The more you know, what he found, what Dr. Gawande found was that the more you know, the more unmanageable it becomes. And do doctors know a lot, guys? Do doctors know a lot? And when you know a lot, big egos, right, Bill, is why they don't do it. But do doctors know a lot? Yeah, they know a lot. And the more you know, the more unmanageable it becomes because there's so many possibilities that could occur, it's hard to know what to do. You start shotgunning it. And guys, do we as advisors know a lot? We know a lot. We know uh, massive amounts of information about people's, uh, how to take care of people financially. And if we don't have a checklist, we're bound to what? Shotgun. Try this, try that, try this, try that, try this, try that. With, if you have a checklist, you're not going to miss anything. So here's a great checklist that uh, Bill Good came up with, which was to prepare for a client call. You should, first of all, review client account before you call them. Seems simple. How many people call their clients before they review their uh, client's account? I know tons of guys that do that. Review the last note. Tons of guys forget to do that. Simple, simple. Review the profile. Am I up to date on financial status, tax status, investment objectives, other reasonable information needed? Decide uh, on the objective of the call. So really, are these rocket science things? No. But could, how much more productive could the call be if you did these things? You might find a heck of a lot more money if you do these things. Now set an agenda. Check how their family's doing. Ask the client what's on their mind. Agree on the agenda. Full funds. Check for outside investments. Promote referrals. Then what you do, uh, should have a, uh, then you should have a place to write down your notes. What did happen? Actions. What will happen? Opportunities. Investments are events that will be uh, result in cash available for the future. Outside investments discovered. Services uh, uh, issues. Referrals received. Messages to send. Every one of your clients, when you go to the, if I go to your client's file. For a review meeting, what should I see? For a guy who's making a ton of money, for a guy who's making a ton of money, what should I see? I should see one of these at least for every single year, if not twice a year. And they should look, they should have, be hitting all these things. I should have a piece of paper with notes on it, what happened at that um, uh, meeting, what was supposed to happen after that meeting, what action was supposed to be taken. What, op, what investments or events were a result in cash in the future? Outside investments discovered. I don't care if it's none. Say none there, but you should have that there. Service issues that they've had. Referrals received. Messages sent. Do you have this for every single one of your uh, uh, client uh, meetings? If not, guess what you're missing? Probably tons of money, tons of ways to get more referrals, 
tons of ways to make that client more loyal to you. On and on and on. Now, I believe in checklists. Here's how every single manual, you're going to find a checklist. For events manual, for the seminar manual, you're going to find checklists. For the client appreciation events, you're going to find checklists. For epidemic marketing, you find checklists. Every single thing I give you gives you checklists. And most importantly, we have the 21-point checklist, right? The disclosure meeting is all about a checklist. In fact, that's when I first developed the checklist for myself and I made almost a million a year, all it was was a Word document with a bunch of check marks on it. That's all it was. Now, we've turned it into a nice, beautiful thing for you, so it makes it look like it's worth a lot more than a Word document with a bunch of check marks on it, but I made my money with just a list with check marks on it. You've got the actual software that puts those check marks into a proposal that looks like it's worth $10,000, $5,000 in, in uh, uh, fees to do that checklist. That's why I've given it to you, but essentially all it is is a 21-point checklist. We look at the same 21 things on every single client. And Jeff, you have been doing helping guys with these checklists for oh, did you lose me? Uh, six, eight years. How many people on uh, on the average, what's the average? What's the high for 21 points and what's the low for 21 points? So what's the average uh, that we find for every single guy that we look at? Every well, the guy. high is 21. The low, I'd say, is 13 or 14 with the average being 16 or 17. So you said low was 13 or 14? We, we have not had a zero? No, we've never a, had a zero. A five, a 10? Nope. Guys, so by doing this 21-point checklist, I'm think about this. The reason I love working with middle income or the, the mass affluent, high middle income and mass affluent, is because they don't get these kind of things done for them by their advisor. Do they get do, do they get survivor's guides done and advanced directives done and uh, checking on the powers of return? I mean, all the stuff that we do, titling of their investments, bank accounts, et cetera, beneficiaries on all of their – do they get that kind of checks from, from their current advisor? No, never. Now, these multimillionaires that have, uh, you know, are paying five, ten thousand dollars to their advisor in fees, they may have looked through all those things for their client. But how many mass affluent, how many uh, upper middle income have advisors that go through all these things with them? I, I always make the jokes. I made so much money by doing working for free. I, I made so much money by working for free. Because are we paid to do the survivor's guide? No. Are we paid to do the powers of attorney uh, checks? No. Are we paid for doing the advanced directive? No. We don't pay to do any of those things. But he's, in his essence, I was paid for doing those things because I was able to help them decide for themselves that their advisor could care less about them. And actually even had uh, uh, many cases was actually purposely omitting things to make more money. Now, how could I do all those things? Because I use a checklist, which means I can do them very, very rapidly. When I first started, it used to take me hours and hours and hours to do a proposal for a client. And I whittled that down to where I'm doing a checklist. I was doing case analysis in 40 minutes. I was, I was preparing in 40 minutes. That's all it took me is 40 minutes. And we made it even easier for you with the software. And I was doing a, 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 a tax I would do a, um, a mock tax return for them as well to show them where they're at and where they could be. I was doing all that in 40 minutes, and the only way I could possibly do that in 40 minutes is because I had a checklist. The checklist is an extremely powerful tool. I believe in it. Now there's proof on how powerful it is uh, by Dr. Gawande's book. So you have to ask yourself, am I using checklist to its highest degree? Now we've created a lot for you. All you need to do is use them. And Jeff, what happens when you start winging it instead of using the checklist? Yeah, you start things start falling through the cracks and you miss things. So, and I've seen that with guys. They'll actually say, "Oh, this is a no-brainer. I don't need to. I don't need to do the the uh, twenty-one point checklist with these people because when they came in, Jeff, they they told me they really hated their advisor. So I didn't really need to do the twenty-one point checklist. I'm just going to go for the the actual presentation and, and sell them. What happens? Yeah, and it, and sometimes that can work, but uh, unfortunately, you won't know when you when you needed the checklist until after the fact, after you've lost the client. So we always say, "Go loaded for bear." If you don't need it, then what was the harm in doing it? But, so, so, so Jeff is saying is right. It does work sometimes. So you can just skip that, go right to the presentation, and they really do hate the guy, and they and they move their money to you. But what if they don't? And most times they don't. So 20% of the time they may do that. 80% of the time they don't. And if they don't, here's the problem. When are you going to get them back in? 
Never. Because you've already blown your wad, so it's done. Don't do that. We have checklists for a reason. And checklists are extremely powerful, especially if a checklist has been used thousands of times. Because our checklist, our 21-point checklist, has been used thousands of times successfully. Okay? So there was a lot of things we talked about today. We talked about the variable annuity, um, uh, Hartford variable annuity, and the fact that, <laughs> that uh, they're changing the game in the middle because uh, they can't afford to do these uh, income benefit providers they put in place. That's not a great place to be with with your client. Second thing we talked about is the fear factor. Do you really want a client to be ta asking you why they're paying 3 or 4% fees when the average rate of return is 7%? Or if you're a money manager, we can use that to, to move people who have money managers by asking them questions about is it really fair for somebody that has more money to be paying more than somebody who has less money? Also, does it make any sense to, uh, to um, uh, pay somebody to find a money manager every single year when they should only pay for it one time? Asking those questions is going to get, is going to really, and I would love to come up against any money, I guarantee you, any guy that is, comes in front of me, any client that comes in front of me that has a money manager is done. They become my client instantaneously with those two questions. Oh, uh, Don says, Don Akash says, commercial airline pilots must use checklists. Absolutely right. Uh, uh, absolutely right. Because if they don't, what can happen? So really, the, the checklists are so extremely powerful. So that's all I have for today, guys. Any questions, concerns we can talk about? It was a lot of information. but uh, And again, guys, when, I don't want you to see me as attacking money managers. Am I attacking money managers? No. I'm attacking disclosure, not telling those clients what's happening. Am I attacking variable annuities, Jeff? No. All I'm attacking is what? Just the fact that those those issues aren't disclosed typically. Yeah. So that, I don't want you to think that I'm saying money managers are bad, variable annuities are bad. Uh, there is no good investment out there. There is no bad investment out there. All there are is investments with advantages and disadvantages. But we have to disclose not only the advantages, which people seem to spend hours and hours disclosing, we also have to disclose the disadvantages. And for those of you who have seen my presentation uh, that we used to sell the Wealth Max, that whole 45, 50 minute presentation is going over what? The advantages or the disadvantages? That whole presentation is going over the advantages or the disadvantages? Those of you who have seen it. Let me see an answer on that. So I spent 40, 45 minutes, the disadvantage, everybody's saying, the disadvantage, exactly. So I spent 45 minutes, my whole sales presentation is not talking about how great it is. It's about going through one disadvantage after another. It's going through the disadvantage that the, the rate of return is never going to be really high. It goes through the disadvantage that, hey, you know, it's, it's, it's not completely liquid. It goes through the disadvantage of, uh, you've got to take a big surrender charge to get out of this. It goes through the disadvantage of, hey, now might, be not, might not be the right time to use it. Go through the disadvantage of, hey, you know you're going to get socked with uh, a, a big tax problem here. Go through the disadvantages of how the fees are charged. Go through the, guys, go through, that's how I sell. It's through disadvantages. So uh, somebody's asking, where's the WealthMax presentation? The WealthMax presentation is on the 5Q website. You have to be a member of the 5Q um, group to get access to that, that uh, presentation. If you want to do that, just call a 5Q specialist. Um, and, uh, or email us at support at 5qgroup.com. We'll tell you how to get that. So, guys, this is so important, these checklists. That's why we give them to you. Don't just shrug your shoulders and take shortcuts with them. If you follow the checklist, you're not going to miss anything. And if you don't miss anything, it means you're closer, as close as you can get to perfection. When you start winging it, some meetings are going to go good and some meetings are going to go bad. I don't want some meetings to go good and some meetings to go bad. I want every one of my meetings to be the same. Why do I want every single one of my meetings to be the same? If every single one of my meetings are the same, how many mistakes do I make? None. If this is about minimizing our mistakes. Fair enough, guys? Any questions or comments before I let you go? All right, thanks, bud. Anybody else, guys? All right, then I hope you have a fantastic week, and we, uh, wait, 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 what's next Monday? Next Monday's the first. We won't be having our call next Monday. Okay, so I'm assuming a lot of guys are taking next week off, including myself. So next week, in um, honor of the 4th of July, we will not be having our Monday coaching call, but we will start again on the 8th. 
But if there's anything in between uh, now and the 8th that you have questions with, please get a hold of us. We'd be ha happy to uh, 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 help you out any we can. Okay? Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.